Day three of NAB, and we're back with Dan May of Black Magic Design talking about the host of cameras that were announced uh, on uh, Monday. Dan, thanks for joining us on Donald Talks Technology. I'm very glad to be with you once again. Once again, back together again. So, last year I called you insane. Yeah, that's fair. You know, this year you're like a lost cause. I think that we. Uh you know, we we would bring 80 products if we if we had enough engineering time. So, uh, you know, some 16 or so press releases, 38 new SKUs. Uh, yeah, we we've been staying busy in the development and uh, continue to try to get great products that you know people want to see at the show. So so far, the feedback's been tremendous. So you started off uh, at the at the presser on Monday. Grant Petty took the stage, and the first thing he showed off was the Ursa Mini. Yeah, the Ursa Mini is something that we're uh, you know excited to get out there. We knew last year when we brought out Ursa, we wanted to have that that big kind of full size camera that multiple people could work with and around. Uh, have that uh, turret sensor upgrade ability. We thought it was going to be you know tremendously important. Uh, we knew we'd be able to do higher frame rates because of the body and the style of the Ursa. But you know it's it's always kind of funny to have people come to the show and you know they love it. But we had a number of people that were like, oh, but it's so big and it's so heavy and of course, in the back of our mind, we're like, well, we know because we have these plans for Ursa Mini to have this great single person kind of handheld camera that is, you know, people just look at it and they say, I totally get it. It's a run and gun. I can throw it on the tripod. I can throw it on my shoulder. I can just run it around handheld. Um, so it's, you know, it's great to be able to get to the show and everyone says, oh, it's so great. You listened to what we all said. And this is the camera I've been waiting for and looking for. And, you know, that, that is all true. You know, we obviously have taken a tremendous amount of feedback into uh, the development of this camera and, and uh, you know, to be able to show up with that and have, you know, the new 4.6K sensor. You know, these are these are big announcements that alone would have made, you know, the Black Magic booth kind of buzzing with anticipation. So, you know. Yeah, if you just had it with just the Ursa Mini, that would have been enough. But then you came out with the micro cinema camera. Yeah, we were, we, we you know, we're always looking at how we can kind of uh, further push ourselves. And one of the things that we've noticed with our cameras is that, you know, because of the cost, quite honestly, because of the cost of these cameras, people put them in a lot of different situations that maybe we didn't expect or anticipate. And uh, at, the, at the cost of some of these cameras, you know, people have been putting them, of course, on drones or in underwater housing, using them as crash cams, you know, tucking them into the little corners of the car. So we thought to ourselves, you know, what, what can we do to kind of make, you know, a, a pocket camera that could basically do that a bit better? And that's where we got to the micro cinema camera. Which uh, is essentially a pocket cinema camera in a more compact form factor with a few extra things. Yeah, you know, the big differences between it and the pocket camera are that number one, it's, you know, it's designed so that, you know, all the transport controls are in the front, so I don't have to be behind the, you know, the, when you think about how you're going to use it, with the with the pocket camera, I'm designed to always kind of be behind the camera, I see on the monitor, and I have all my transport controls back there, whereas on the micro cinema camera, there is no screen on there at all. It's basically meant to be, you know, kind of what it, perhaps pre-set up, and then I'm going to go ahead and just hit record on the bot on the front and see my tally light come on, or well, we've got this great expansion port, and that's where we can go ahead and go out, and we can have all these command protocols to start stop, focus assist. So when you talk about putting it up on a drone and being able to send all those protocols out wirelessly down to someone with a controller so that I can actually adjust everything on that camera while it's up on a drone or perhaps in an underwater housing where I can have those controls being physically uh, done there. So that's, you know, that's a big shift from the actual pocket camera model. And then we of course came out with our video assist product so that we have this other screen that we can kind of bring along with it so that we can do any adjustments we need to do, pull it off. If we put it in the corner of the car, but I need to check to make sure my focus is good, I can have that monitor off to the side as opposed to having to be behind the camera. So, you know, really great development that we've done there. And, you know, at the same 995 price, you know, we are looking forward to seeing what crazy things happen with that camera. I'm sure we're going to see people using it for a ton of different stuff we haven't even thought about yet. Yeah, but you did. It, it, it does seem like you designed it for drone operations. Well, we know that there's a great opportunity there. Obviously, drones are something that's you know big at NAB this year. We see it out there, and so you know, first and foremost, you know, being able to have it at that weight and form and function, you know, that's that's kind of the layup. But when you start talking about a 995 camera that can record in ProRes and uh, and raw recording like our original Pocket camera, to have that very post-production friendly compression, but then able to change the optics. You know, this is the big thing that separates it from the action cameras, which are great, but to be able to have the optics on there to be able to do, you know, various MFT-based lenses. Right, because it's Micro Four Thirds. It's still the Micro Four Thirds, so you're going to have that great cinema style, you're going to have that great uh, compression for post-production. You know, that's that's something that was the layup. Now I just got to see what else everyone's going to want to do with it. When I first saw it on the banner, because when, when on the day before NAB, when we flew in, all of a sudden these pictures started flooding Twitter, these banners 
centers and everybody was going, is Black Magic making a drone? <laughs> but it ended up being the, the camera itself. But the camera is like, I was holding out for a pocket, uh, a pocket, uh, 4K pocket, but this is much better. Yeah, we wanted to, you know, we, we knew the drone was going to be the auto connection where people would say like, oh, I totally get it. Again, it gets that initial like, I see what they're doing there. Uh, the big reason we couldn't do the 4K on there is because we needed to do the recording on there, which is kind of why we ended up doing the micro studio camera 4K. That was where I was going next. Was yeah. you, you took that same micro cinema design and then you applied it towards the studio camera with a 4K camera. And uh, how'd that come about? Well, it was, it's essentially that exact reason because we, there was there was two things we were able to kind of do with the one in the one step. On the one hand, we knew, obviously, we, you know, we're taking this feedback that people are giving us. We knew there was a, de a desire to see a pocket 4K camera, but again, to get that to actually happen in that size is not as easy as just making that happen. Uh, so we did the, the, the micro cinema camera knowing we could do the HD in that size, and then the studio 4K camera we could do because we don't have to do any recording on there, so we could get, essentially use the same body style and get the 4K sensor in there. The other big thing that we had seen was that last year when we came to NAB, we had impressed people with these amazing studio cameras that we had built, but we got so much feedback from guys who were like, this is great because it's affordable and it has the tally and the talkback and the CCU control. The only problem is I don't have a bunch of operators. I'm just putting a bunch of cameras out there and I don't need the big screen. I don't need some of that functionality. So, okay, here's a couple things we can do here. We can make this 4K camera in the small shape, but if there's not an operator there, we don't need the big screen. So we can use the same body. I've seen plenty of studios that are guys that are doing just streaming stuff and they just have six or seven fixed cameras that are being cut between. I still have all my great color shading, I still have my great tally light on there. And the other great thing is because we have that same expansion port, one of the other big things folks have wanted to do was to put, that's a micro four thirds lens on there, but they do a B4 to micro four thirds adapter to get the fast glass on there, but they lose the iris control because they can't communicate through the micro four thirds. Well, now we can add that back in by using the expansion port. So using that same body, we're able to knock out a couple things, small camera, 4K, expansion port for the B4 adapter, and then being able to have you know a great studio camera that doesn't have an operator behind it. So you know it was a great kind of luck of development to kind of fill a couple of needs with a with a couple of products there. And you also had, now you, you had six, 18, no 16. 16 or so. 16 pressing. products, yeah. 30, 30 skews, 38, skew, 38, 38 skews. Yeah. So let's let's round out let's round out the, the hip parade. The, the the big thing is is the that Teradex, the Teranex the uh, Teranex Mini. The the big thing is we we looked at our, our line and realized we needed to do 12 gig SDI. We had, we had started last year with our first Teranex product and 12 gig SDI is important because especially in the broadcast space people are waiting to invest until they have high frame rates for Ultra HD and that's what 12 gig SDI is going to give us the ability to have uh, a high frame rate Ultra HD and be able to uh, you know, get that over you know a single SDI cable. So there's a number of new products you see in there that are a little less glamorous. There's a new ATEM, there's a new Video Hub, there's a number of new I/O products, uh, and they're all 12 gigs kind of updates. The things only studio engineers would be excited. Only about. things studio engineers, and they're not as sexy as say cameras. But the Terranex Minis are really important, and they they are good looking, and and people can look at it and say I totally get that product. And it's definitely mini. It's, and, it's they're def small. and they're definitely small. And you know we, we we had wanted to do those 12 gig converters like our traditional converters, but again, 12 gig runs hot, so we needed to build a bigger box. So again, how can we knock out a couple of different needs that we have? And one of them was to have rack mounted kind of mini converters. So the idea here of being able to have the extra space for that 12 gig heat and thermal capacity, but be able to have that unit sit on the desk or be able to put three of them in a one RU system. So have this whole new line of Terranex Minis, great to have either the powered ethernet can power them or they have their own power adapter, they have software that can control them, they have dip switches to control them, you can get them with that panel so you can have the great LCD. We know that people like to see LCDs and racks so they know things are working and have adjustments there. So, you know, $500 for the base models and then $900 to have the 12 gig fiber. That's how we solve the other 12 gig problem, which is distance, because the 12 gig SDI can't go as far as traditional SDI can. So we knew we needed to have fiber in there to be able to have, you know, if I'm going to build a building or a stadium or be running long distance, we need that 12 gig fiber. So we're getting there with that as well. So that's really where that that 4K studio camera will come in handy. I, I could see you putting those all around a, like a football stadium. Yeah, exactly. We want to be able to. We want to be able to kind of do what SDI, and that's the great part about this SDI protocol over fiber, is it feels like traditional SDI, but it's fiber, and fiber is not that expensive, and it can be run by anybody. We can have just regular contractors go in and put fiber in an installation, so 
you know, we think that's going to be a big part of the solution when we talk about high frame rate ultra HD. So a number of new SKUs that you're going to see throughout there that are 12 gig, uh, 12 gig SDI, which are you know exciting to us. Obviously, cameras take a lot of air out of the room, so. Yeah, it does. But you know, what are you going to do? So, all right. Well, so to so to to summarize, we've got we've got the Blackmagic Ursa Mini, which starts at. Twenty nine ninety five and goes all the way up to fifty four ninety five. That's correct. Okay, and we have and Those that are four K models and four point six K models in EF and PL mounts. That's right, and then we have that four point six K sensor, which can be upgraded to the regular Ursa, and that's a two which is kind of cool. It's only two thousand dollars, so you could like send in your Ursa. You don't even have to send in the Ursa. We actually, you just oh, it's plug and play. And we send it out to them, and they can do it themselves. It's basically a it's a, I, I relate to it like installing a CPU on a computer. If you can oh, yeah. if you can do that with a thermal grease, or we supply a thermal pad, then you're fully capable of upgrading the camera yourself. All right, yeah, that's good to go. And that, and and uh, then we have the, the. When is that due? So is pretty, pretty much the way I look at it is all the camera stuff is in the July time frame, and then all the 12 gig stuff is in the May June time frame. And and then the uh, the the micro the micro cinema camera is 995. Yep. You're insane. Yep. And then there's the and then there's the studio camera, the studio micro camera, which is 12 12 yep. You're insane again. Yep. And that's about the same price that the studio camera was. No, a little less than the studio camera last year. It's less than the HD version, which was 19.95, and the 4K version was actually uh, 29.95. Am I getting that right? Dude, seriously. <laughs> so for 12.95 to be able to get a 4K. A 4K studio camera, like yeah, obviously it's a lot of value in there. And and, and that's going to be in July, and then the B4 connector is coming later in the fall. Uh, Maybe ish. We have not decided when that's going to be done. You know, we we obviously have been looking at B4 a whole lot to see what we want to do there. Um, but we we knew the Ursa Mini was the next big priority, so that's where we got the uh, for this NAB right now at least. Okay, so now the last question: What's on the horizon? I know well, you're going to deny it. Yeah, we have a lot to we have a lot to develop there. You know, we haven't even touched the software updates with Resolve 12, Fusion 8. There's a lot of development that we're doing. There. Oh yeah, that's right. Let's talk about that. You you also announced an update to Fusion 8. Yeah, Fusion 8. You know, we had acquired that uh, software last year. Uh, we want to just get those guys focused on uh, getting it onto a Mac. It's been a PC version for many many years, and we uh, we want to get the we want to get that onto Mac because there's such a big creative you know, group out there that are all on the Mac. Obviously, we've, we've been big supporters of the Apple uh, ecosystem for a long time. So very first thing we need to do there is to, you know, get it on a Mac. And we thought maybe we'd have it kind of mostly working on a Mac. We're showing all of our demos, even our stage demo running on a Mac. So, you know, it's an incredibly powerful software with this node-based system. Uh, it's kind of the secret sauce of Hollywood, and we want to get it out there. We have this great free version for people. We'll get it on the Mac, and we'll just kind of keep building on that. That's right. Well. You're giving away a free version, much like you have done with the DaVinci. It's going to be a light version. Yeah. What about... 60, 80 percent of the functionality thereabouts. Well, but pretty much what we learned with Resolve Lite was we should have called Resolve Lite Resolve, and we should have called Resolve the paid version Resolve Pro or whatnot, because Resolve is so powerful in its light format that the light almost seems like a like a, a, a negative towards it. So what we did with Fusion was we basically took the Fusion that you used to pay for the base model, and that's the free version. There's nothing taking out of it. It's the full Fusion that you would have bought for a couple of grand back in the day. And the Fusion Studio is all the other kind of accessory softwares like generation and more studio level stuff. That's what you're getting in Fusion Studio. But the actual free version is Fusion. It is the Fusion that used to be charged. So uh, tremendously powerful. We think people, you know, the big trick we have with Fusion is to kind of tell people what it can do for them. There's a lot of great examples of major motion pictures that use Fusion, but for a lot of us, you know, I just want to create a 3D stinger, or I want to do a 3D title, or I want to do a bit of rotoscoping. These are things that I can't just easily do in an NLE that I can start to easily learn how to do in this powerful node-based software. But got to get it on a Mac, got to give it to people for free so they can start learning and, and working with that application. And then when you throw in the fact that you can you can edit in Resolve, so you you're, you kind of have like just a suite there. Yeah, so you don't even have to get near anything else. We're, we're, we're working really hard to you know continue to develop Resolve you know, obviously we've been in this industry for a long time. We've worked with a lot of NLE partners. We understand the gravitas of kind of calling it now an NLE. You know, that's not something we take lightly. We've put a ton of work in it over the last two years. Eleven had a tremendous amount of updates to the editing software. Uh, we didn't feel like it was right to call it an NLE at this point. But this, you know, at some point you're going to get to a point where, you know, look, it's doing all of these things. We're going to look foolish if we don't call it what it is. And it, it has all that NLE capability now. Now that makes it, you know, great to work with all the other NLEs that are out there. It makes round tripping easier. We're going to continue to work openly with all of our partners out there and that's going to be the case.